Thank you for that introduction, Holly. Hello, and welcome to Delving into the World of Lyser Jamets, the past, present, and future. My name is Danny St. Germain, and this is Camila watson Gooden. Hey, we'll be talking about the history and the pharmacology of LSD, as well as discussing the synthesis modification sites and how that relates to what you'll see in your casework, as well as the nomenclature and uh, strategies for interpreting the EIA mass spec fragmentation of this class of compounds. If you look in your, the portal or in our Teams meeting, we'll have a couple of handouts that will be relevant later on when we go over some exercises. So if you want to pull those up while you're watching this so that you have a resource available to you during those exercises, now would be a good time to do that. LSD is one of the most popular and notorious drugs of the 20th century. It has been highlighted in multiple documentaries, books, and movies, such as Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, Hamilton Morrison's Pharmacopoeia, and Have a Good a Trip, Adventures in Psychedelics on Netflix. Its common name is acid, and the experience after cons uh, consumption is colloquially referred to as a trip or tripping. Uh, these trips are described as mystical experiences that lead to intensely emotional and life-changing insights by past patients and recreational users. Higher doses and inappropriate settings can result in negative experiences, which are also called bad trips. LSD has a rich history. Um, so let's ask ourselves, how did we get here? It all begins with the fungus Claviceps, specifically Claviceps purpurea. This is an infectious fungus that contaminates grains, such as rye. It is made up of a sclerodium, this dark structure here that is emanating out of the wheat. Um, fruiting body, and that contains active alkaloids with the ergoline core, and it's collectively referred to as ergot. The ergoline core is comprised of three ring uh, systems. We have an indole, a cyclohexyl group, and a piperidinyl group, which can be further broken down into four different ring systems, um, A, B, C, and D. A is the benzene backpack on the pyrrole portion of the indole, and then, of course, we have our cyclohexyl group and then our piperidinyl group. And this will come into play a little bit later when we talk about name uh, nomenclature. There are three classes. Uh, there are the ergoamides, the ergopeptides, and clavines, which are not pictured uh, because they lack one or more of the functionalities that uh, result in the psychedelic properties of this class of compounds. Um, LSD resembles the ergoamides. As you can see, we have the amide functional group here and here. Um, and the ergopeptides also have that amide functionality, which is very important for their pharmacology. It's because of this ergoline core that lysergic amides hit a lot of different receptors, um, and that complicates their pharmacology. Ergot alkaloids as a whole are active at the serotonin, dopamine, and adrenergic receptors. And you can see how these uh, structures can fold to foot within the ergoline core. We've got serotonin, the dopamine can flip to fit within, as well as the noradrenaline, which is the agonist for um, adrenergic receptors. And because they can fit within the ergoline core, that allows these, the ergoline structures to mimic the effects of these neurotransmitters. And given how promiscuous these ligands are, it's not surprising that consumption of ergot has historically caused hallucinations, convulsions, and erratic behavior. Ergot alkaloids stimulate smooth muscle contractions, and when used in excess can lead to valvular heart disease and ergotism. Ergotism is a term that describes blood vessels that constrict to the point where blood can no longer flow. Uh, in extreme cases, this vasoconstriction leads to necrosis, and if it's not effectively treated, it can lead to death. Now remember that ergot is a fungus that hosts many different alkaloids, and while it's notorious for its detrimental effects, uh, singular alkaloids dosed appropriately have been used in modern medicine as effective pharmaceuticals to treat medical conditions such as migraine and postpartum hemorrhage. For instance, the dopamine agonism of bromocryptine is used in conjunction, in conjunction with L-DOPA to treat Parkinson's disease, a neurological disorder that arises from a lack of dopamine in the brain. Notable figures who have Parkinson's disease or have had Parkinson's disease include Michael J. Fox, Muhammad Ali, and Ozzy Osbourne. 
Ergot is one of the oldest uh, recorded natural pharmaceuticals and psychedelics. To LSD dates back to ancient times. Infested grains, dubbed Simona and Meru, were recorded as far back as 1900 BCE in Mesopotamia. Chinese philosopher and physician Chu Cheng recorded the use of ergot in obstetrics in 1100 BCE, and Hippocrates, the father of medicine, echoed its use under the name melanthion for postpartum hemorrhage in 370 BCE. Remember that ergot restricts blood flow, so it is effective for preventing heavy and uncontrolled bleeding after childbirth. However, ergotism claimed the lives of 20,000 people in France in just one year between the years 944 and 945. In the late 1500s, German physician and botanist Adam Lonesser observed and recorded midwives using a preparation of ergot called pulvis ad partum to induce uterine contractions to facilitate childbirth. While this was effective in some cases, it often resulted in uterine rupture leading to the name pulvis ad mortem. Its use was eventually discontinued for anything other than prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. And as we discussed earlier, ergot can cause hallucinations, convulsions, and erratic behavior, which is why many suspect ergot poisoning was a contributing factor in the Salem Witch Trials of 1692. In 1820, ergot was introduced into the first edition of the United States Pharmacopeia as an officially sanctioned therapy for postpartum hemorrhage. Ergotamine tartrate was patented by Arthur Stoll in 1918, kicking off the industrial production of ergot alkaloids as pharmaceuticals. And in 1935, ergonavine was introduced as a therapeutic, and its analog methyl ergometrine is still used today. Three years later, in 1938, chemistry legend Albert Hoffman synthesized the world's most notorious psychedelic, LSD, from ergot alkaloids. Fifteen years after Sandoz Pharmaceutical Company uh, colleague Arthur Stoll isolated and patented ergotamine, Albert Hoffman began utilizing the compound as a scaffold to search for a more effective analeptic. He hydrolyzed ergotamine to form lysergic acid and then popped on various amide groups um, to form a series of lysergic acid uh, amides. And he created LSD with a diethylamine and created it, or dubbed it LSD-25. And as a medicinal chemist, he was changing the amide portions of the molecule to improve upon the activity of the original target, ergonavine. And he named this new compound LSD-25 because it was the 25th compound in the series he was, he was working on. But because the compounds he was working on were inferior to ergotavine for the purposes they were studying, the project was abandoned. Another five years would pass until he was inspired to re-examine LSD-25, and while working with the compound, accidentally absorbed some onto his skin. As he recalls, he felt a remarkable but not unpleasant state of intoxication, characterized by an intense stimulation of the imagination and an altered state of awareness of the world. Three days later, he intentionally dosed himself with 250 micrograms and rode his bicycle home with his assistant, tripping the whole way. And henceforth, April 19th, has been dubbed Bicycle Day. Uh, though his experience, through his experience, he realized that um, there was a huge potential for LSD in researching the mind, and Sandoz marketed the compound under the name Delicid, distributing it to researchers and clinicians free of charge, provided they shared their findings. In the 1950s, the CIA seized upon the mind-bending properties of LSD in the MK Ultra Initiative, which had tested multiple substances to discover an agent for mind control. LSD soon gained notoriety as the poster child of 1960s counterculture, and in 1971, uh, psychedelics like LSD were controlled worldwide, bringing research on the topic to a screeching halt. Nearly 50 years later, we're seeing a large push of research in the field of psychedelics. These compounds affect neuroplasticity, which is the brain's ability to disrupt day-to-day -day processes while making new connections, which affects lasting change. And as a measure of just how far attitudes have changed regarding psychedelic therapy, in December of 2023, the Douglas Mike Day Psychedelic Therapy to Save Lives Act was approved, allocating funds for clinical trials researching psychedelics for PTSD and traumatic brain injuries experienced by active duty members of the United States military. This bill covers MDMA, psilocybin, ibogaine, and 5-methoxy-DMT. 
Uh, there are also several clinical trials in the recruiting process utilizing LSD as the drug candidate in Switzerland and the Netherlands. These trials are using LSD as a tool to investigate major depressive disorder, mood effects and anxiety, palliative care, neuroplasticity, cluster headaches, and the pharmacological effects and co-administration of LSD with other medications. A small phase two clinical trial from the University of Basel found that acute positive experiences with LSD correlated with long-term reduction in anxiety symptoms. They did also observe some negative effects, but research is still ongoing. At present, the neuroplastic effects of psychedelics are primarily associated with serotonin receptors. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that modulates mood, cognition, memory, and learning reward behaviors and is commonly referred to as the happy molecule. It has a tryptamine backbone and a hydroxy group at the 5 position, and um, it's called 5-HT for 5-hydroxytryptamine. Again, we can see how serotonin can fit within the ergoline structure of LSD, which is why LSD binds to these receptors. There are seven types of serotonin receptors and they're labeled 5-HT1 through 7. For instance, the 5-HT2A receptor here is located in um, heavily concentrated areas of the brain that control higher processing, such as uh, cognition and social interactions. While in, in contrast, the 5-HT2B receptor is found in higher abundance in the cardiovascular system. Now, Hoffman's recognition of, of the power of LSD as a tool uh, to study the mind cannot be understated. LSD has a unique binding profile in serotonin receptors. Um, typically, um, when we think about agonists binding to the receptors, it's like an on-off switch, and this is a very, very basic uh, explanation. When the agonist binds to the receptor, it turns the switch on, it does its job, it unbinds and turns the light off when it's done. When LSD was crystallized with the HT2B receptor here, uh, what they found was when it inserts itself into the pocket, the receptor forms a little lid over top of the receptor opening, and that effectively traps LSD in the pocket and that keeps the receptor turned on and um, locks it into an on position. And this is likely why Ergo demonstrated some of the adverse cardi cardiac effects that we discussed earlier because the HT2B receptor is found in your vascular system. Um, so when it's in the on position, it does that, it initiates that blood constriction, and then you have those negative effects. While prevailing wisdom states that activation of the 5-HT2A receptor is essential for the psychedelic experience in humans, um, it's not necessarily um, the only thing that affects that experience. But if we look at this binding pocket, if the same phenomenon happens in the 5-HT2A pocket, it could also explain why LSD trips last so much longer than other psychedelics. The mechanism of LSD remains unclear, Receptor binding studies show that it is mixed agonism at serotonin, dopamine, and adrenergic receptors because of its ergoline core. And when we look at binding constants, the lower the Ki value here, the stronger the compound binds to that receptor, um, which means that it binds at lower doses. So if we look at LSD's binding um, at the HT2A receptor, it takes 2.7 nanomolar concentration of this compound to elicit an effect. And this is why dosage typically lasts, or to dosages are uh, milligram and submilligram dosages, and it's why they also last a little bit longer. LSD is taken orally, and the effects can last up to 10 hours with a half life um, at approximately three hours, meaning it takes three hours to metabolize half the dose that was taken. The psychedelic uh, properties of LSD are heavily dependent on the location of the substituents, their spatial position, and their degrees of saturation. Um, there are two types of numbering for the positions of LSD. We have the IUPAC naming um, numbering, and if you use software like ChemDraw or um, if you look on SciFinder, this is the numbering that you will likely encounter, but the more commonly used numbering system is the Hoffman notation, 
with the numbering starting at N1 of the indole nitrogen and then going around the ring. And that's the numbering that we'll be using to discuss the, um, the structures from here on out. So the location of the substituents, their spatial position, their degrees of saturation, um, affect the psychedelic activity and this activity is diminished when any of the following happens. If the double bond is saturated between bonds 9 and 10, that will diminish the uh, psychedelic effects. Uh, if the stereochemistry is inverted at positions 8 and 5, if you think about this wedge here and here, Think about those two substituents coming out at you from the board, if we're looking at this in 3D. If you invert that, it changes to dashes, and that means that those are now facing away from you. Um, if the amine substitution length changes, um, it seems to be optimal with a diethylamine here at this position. If you lengthen the chain or shorten the chain, that can diminish the activity. And um, if you add a substitution here at the two position, that can also um, render it pretty much inactive. And that's why 2-bromo-LSD is an attractive target and current compound of interest because it lacks the cardiac side effects and the psychedelic effects in mouse studies. It's slated for human clinical trials in 2024. And for these reasons, I wouldn't expect to see many of these modifications in your casework. And as if the pharmacology wasn't complicated enough, let's talk about how some of these lysergamids are named. The nomenclature of the amide portion of LSD sometimes derives from the ethyl amino substituents uh, in tryptamine nomenclature. So as a refresher, the first substituent on the amine is typically the abbreviation of the smaller carbon chain, followed by the larger carbon chain, followed by base T, as in methyl isopropyl tryptamine. And you can see these are the common ethyl amino code letters, M for methyl, IP for isopropyl, and isosec and tert designate the configuration of the carbons on the chain, and they're always lowercase. This may not be the case in um, lysergamids, but it is for tryptamines, just so you know the difference. And if the substitution on the amine is the same, then the first letter is swapped out into form D for di, and then the abbreviation of the uh, amino chain length followed by the base T, so di methylamine for the two methyl groups here. And then if there's only one substituent, then N replaces that first letter for um, you to know that there's only one substituent N followed by the uh, abbreviation for ethyl T for the base T tryptamine. And um, as an example, utilizing this nomenclature style is MIPLA, where we see the structure of LSD has swapped the diethyl amide for a methyl isopropyl amide group. And with that, I'll hand it off to Camille to explain a little bit more in uh, the, name, the nomenclature and rules and super fun. Thank you, Danny. We will be looking at the naming of analogs based on the modification at the amide highlighted in green, the piperidine ring highlighted in blue, and ring B of the indole highlighted in pink. We will be looking at some well-known examples, some of which will use LSD as the parent, which is the Hoffman naming convention, and others which use LAD as the parent, which is a Shulgin naming convention. So considering what we, just, we have just reviewed for the tryptamines, let us go into the naming focusing on some of the amide modifications at N18. The first example is MIPLA, where M stands for methyl, IP, isopropyl, L, lysergic, and lysergic acid, and A for amide. The order of the listing of the substituents is the same as that of tryptamines, which lists the smaller substituent first, hence methyl is listed before isopropyl. The next example is LAMPA, where L stands for lysergic, A, acid, M, methyl, P, propyl, 
and A, amide. Again, this follows the listing for the tryptamine where the smaller substituent is listed first, hence methyl is listed before propyl. Next, we have LSM775, where L comes from lysergic, S also from lysergic, and M is morpholide, which describes this morpholine substituent of the amide. This is a single cyclic substituent, so the tryptamine convention does not apply in this case. The next example is LSZ, where L comes from lysergic, S also from lysergic, and Z is the Z in azetidide. Now, why did we use Z instead of A in this case? This is to avoid confusion with LSA. And again, because the azetoside is a cyclic substituent, the naming convention applied to tryptamines does not apply in this case. I just want to make a note as well that these are not the only NAT modifications that you will see. Now let's go through the naming where the modification is at the piperidyl nitrogen N6. The first example is ALAD, where AL stands for alid, L, lysergic, A, acid, and D, diethylamide. The next example is ethlad, where eth stands for ethyl, L, lysergic, A, acid, D, diethylamide. And the last example, prolad, where pro stands for propyl, L, lysergic, A, acid, and D, diethylamide. For all these examples listed, they follow the Shulgin naming convention, which uses LAD as the parent name. Now let's go through the naming where the modification is at N1, ring B of the indole. All the examples use the Hoffman convention, LSD, as the parent, except for ALD52, where LD is used as the parent. For ALD52, A is for acetyl, L, lysergic acid, and D, diethylamide. For the next example, 1P LSD, 1 denotes the position, P stands for propionyl, which is a substituent, LS, lysergic acid, D, diethylamide. Our next example, 1B LSD, 1 again denotes the position, B stands for butanoil, which is the substituent, LS, from lysergic acid, and D, diethylamide. Next example, 1V LSD, 1 denotes the position, V stands for valeroil, LS, lysergic acid, and D, diethylamide. And our final example, 1CP LSD, where again 1 denotes the position, CP stands for cyclopropionyl, LS, lysergic acid, and D, diethylamide. Now please note, once again, that these are not the only N1 modifications that you will come across. I will now hand over to Danny, who will discuss the synthesis of lysergamides. Thanks, Camille. In order to understand what might emerge on direct-to-user sites, uh, we also need to understand a little bit about the synthesis. So these are the three sites that are most commonly manipulated on lysergamides. We have the N18, position, the N6 position, and the N1 position. So you'll see amide substitution, uh, ring D substitution, and indole B ring substitution. The diethylamide group can easily be swapped out utilizing a base hydrolysis in order to cleave off this gigantic lettuce here to form your lysergic acid. And then a amino acid coupling or acid chloride strategy can be utilized to um, aminate the um, LSD analog. And typically, these clandestine labs prefer cheap amino starting materials like a morpholine, the azetidine, the diethylamine, methyl isopropylamine, and methylpropylamine. These are just a few of those examples. And then that forms your LSD, your LSC, LSM775, 
Lampa, and Nipla. The piperidine N6 position can then undergo um, demethylation to form your nor LSD, which nor means without, so nor methyl, without methyl, and then an alkylation strategy with a some kind of chain with an appropriate leaving group can then undergo an alkylation to form your new analog. Um, again, cheap alkyl starting materials with an appropriate leaving group here at the X. It can be a halogen, a mesyl group, a tosylate, whatever. And you can make an ethyl substituent with your ethlad, propyl substituent with your prolad, an allyl group will give you allad, and a propargyl group will give you pargylad. Again, just a few examples. The hard work of creating a new analog has uh, been done. The most straightforward way to circumvent uh, regulation is to add an acyl substituent or an alkyl substituent to this uh, N1 nitrogen. And um, we've seen uh, a rise in acylated analogs in the past few years. Typically, uh, cheap carboxylic acid materials are used um, and then they can undergo um, a transformation to the acyl chloride or an Weinram amide, some kind of leaving group, and then acylate that N1 substituent. Um, some examples of popular analogs in the past few years include ALD52, uh, 1P LSD, 1Cyclopropyl LSD, 1B LSD, and 1V LSD. And just as we saw with fentanyl, where there's multiple substitution sites, there's also a multitude of combinations that are possible. With just 12 amines, four alkyl groups, and one isolation, I've come up with 104 analogs, not including their regioisomers. In addition to all of the analog possibilities, there are also a few byproducts that you may encounter in your casework. Lysergibins are fragile. Uh, they are unstable when they're exposed to strong acidic or basic conditions, and they can epimerize the amide substituent to the diastereomer of the compound. In this particular case, it's uh, the iso-LSD. Recall that this wedge indicates that this amide substituent is pointing out of the board toward you, as with this hydrogen, um, but under strong acid and basic, basic conditions. This epimerizes and the wedge converts to a dash, which means that the amide is pointing away from you into the board. But the hydrogen is still in that position where it's facing toward you, and that makes these diastereomers. Um, so the because there are two different stereocenters, they'll have slightly different retention times. Uh, both diastereomers have the same fragmentation pattern, but if you inject your standard and the retention time doesn't line up exactly in your method, you may have encountered the ISO uh, form. And then uh, lysergimids are also notorious for decomposing when they're exposed to light, especially in solution. The main product formed is this Lumi LSD, which occurs when light catalyzes uh, the addition of water or an alcohol across this double bond. Uh, there's also a multitude of other decomposition products, but the Lumi is the major impurity. Um, and then depending on the solvent, the rate of decay will depend on that solvent. So here we see ethanol um, decomposing. It takes about 300 minutes for LSD to decompose to about 50% of its original potency, while with chloroform, it takes less than an hour to decompose completely. And with that, I will hand it back over to Camille so that she can discuss uh, how these compounds fragment and um, discuss strategies for identifying this class of compounds in your casework. Thanks, Danny. Now we're going to go into the fragmentation of lysergamides, focusing on the modifications on the amide region at N18, N6 of the piperidine ring, and N1 of the indole. We will discuss the similarities and differences between analogs and how you can use this information to help in deciphering the identity of an unknown you may come across in your casework. Based on the analysis of the GCMS data for several of our analogs, we created this list of tips for interpretation. 
we'll be looking at different examples to highlight each tip, making note of the similarities and differences. So for our first example, we'll be focusing on tips one and two. The surgery mites typically show the molecular ion peak. An observation of a peak at 221 is an indicator that you have a methyl group at N6. For our first example, we'll be looking at the fragmentation of LSD. We see the molecular ion peak at 323. We see the peak at 221, which is the base peak. And just to remind you, according to tip two, an observation of this peak at 221 indicates that we have a methyl group at the N6 position. We see a peak at 207, and this peak actually corresponds to multiple fragments. We also see a peak at 181. This peak also has multiple fragments. And finally, a peak at 72, which corresponds to the diethylamine fragment of the amide. Now let's take a look at the summary of the bond cleavage that leads to some of the fragments we have seen so far. Cleavage of the amide, the substituent on N6 of the pepperidol ring, and the substituent on N1, whether it is a hydrogen or an acyl group, would lead to the 207 fragments. Cleavage of the amide, the pepperidol ring, and the substituent on N1, whether it's a hydrogen or an acyl group, would lead to the 207 and 181 fragments. These fragments are independent of the substitutions on N1, N6, and N18 of the analog. Cleavage of the amide would lead to the 221 fragment in the case where R is equal to hydrogen and R1 is equal to a methyl group. If R is an acyl group, then a second peak would be another peak would be observed that has a mass that is equal to 221 plus the mass of the acyl group minus one. For our next example, we'll be focusing on tips two and three. Tip two states that a peak at 221, which is in some cases the base peak, indicates that the substituent on N6 is a methyl group. And tip three, analogs with an acyl substituent at N1 shows a second base peak in some cases with a mass that is equal to 221 plus the mass of the acyl group minus one. Let us take a look at the fragmentation of 1P LSD. We see the molecular ion peak at 379. We also see two, a peak at 221, which is our base peak and is indicative of a methyl substituent on N6. We see another peak at 277. We see a peak at 207, 181, 72, and 57. If we take a look at the overall picture, we can see the peaks at 221, 207, 181, and 72 are similar to that of LSD, with two additional peaks at 277 and 57. If we look at 57, 57 corresponds to the acetylium ion of the propionyl substituent on N1. The peak at 277 agrees with our third tip that stated that, our an that for an analog with an acyl group substituent, a second peak would be observed with a mass that is equal to 221 plus the mass of the acyl substituent minus 1. In our case, 221 plus 57 minus 1 equals 277. Now, let us go through an example focusing on tips 1, 2, and 5. Just to remind ourselves of what the tips are. Tip 1, the surgimides typically show their molecular ion peak. Tip 2, a peak observed at 221 means that you have a methyl substituent on N6. And tip 5, which states that the observation of a peak at 72 could mean you have a diethyl substituent as, in LS, as with LSD on your amide 
or a methyl isopropyl, as you would observe from EPLA analogs, or a methyl propyl that you would, that you would observe for LAMPA analogs. In our first example, we'll look at the fragmentation of LAMPA. So we see the molecular iron peak at 323. We see 221, which is our base peak. We also see 207, 181, and 72. We'll look at the overall picture. The peaks at 221, 207, 181, and 72 are all very similar to LSD. As a matter of fact, LAMPA has the same M plus as LSD. The only difference between the two here is the fragments you observe for MZ272, where it, for LSD, this fragment is derived from the diethyl substituent, whereas for LAMPA, this is derived from the methyl propyl substituent. Now let us take a look at our other example and take a look at the fragmentation of MEPLA. We see our molecular ion peak at 323, which is the same as LSD and LAMPA. We see our, our peak at 221, which is indicative of our um, methyl group as the substituent on N6. And this peak at 221 is the base peak. We also observe the peak at 207, 181, and 72. At the overall picture, we will see that the peaks at 221, 207, 181 is similar to that of LSD. The only difference here again, as we saw with LAMPA, is our fragments for 72, where LSD has, these fragments is derived from the diethyl substituent on the amide, but for MEPLA, this, this, uh, these fragments are derived from the methyl isopropyl substituent on the amide. The comparison of the mass spectra of LSD, MEPLA, and LAMPA, all of which has the same molecular weight, shows how very similarly they fragment. Therefore, if any one of these analogs were to be present in any of your samples, you could not solely depend on the mass spectrum to determine which analog is present. You will definitely need to employ some other analytical methods and a standard to help with this determination. For the next example, we'll be focusing on tips two, three, and five. Just a reminder again, tip two states that if you observe a peak at 221, that's an indicator that you have a methyl group on N6. Tip three, if you have an acyl group on N1, you'll often see a second peak that has a mass that is equal to 221 plus the mass of the acyl group minus one. And tip five, if you see 72, it would mean that you either have a diethyl, methyl isopropyl, methyl propyl substituent on your amide. Now let's take a look at the fragmentation of 1P MEPLA. We see the molecular ion peak, 379. We see 221, which is our base peak, and again indicative that of the fact that we have a methyl group on the substituent, um, methyl group substituent on N6. We see an additional peak at 277, and we see our peaks at 207, 181, 72, and an additional peak at 57. If we look at the overall picture, the peaks at 277, 221, 207, 181, 57, and 72 for 1P MEPLA are very similar to what you observe for 1P LSD. The only difference is the fragments responsible for the peak at 72 for MEPLA, that peak comes from the methyl isopropyl substituent of your amide, whereas for 1P LSD, it is the diethyl substituent of the amide. For the next examples, we will be looking at analogs which has a group other than a methyl group at the N6 position. According to tip 4, for this analog, we do not expect to see a peak at 221, and we could see the peak at 207 as a base peak. Let's take a look at our first example, which is the fragmentation of Allad. We see our molecular ion peak. 
we see the peak at 207, which is now our base peak. We see the peak at 181. See the peak at 72. And now we see a new peak at 247. And if you look closely at the spectrum, you'll realize that we do not see a peak at 221. And that should not be surprising as our substituent on the N6 at the N6 position is not a methyl group, but an allyl group. And that is the reason why you see this peak here at 247. The peak at 247, that fragment looks very similar to your 221 fragment, but instead of a methyl group on N6, there is an allyl group. Let's take a look at our other example, 1P ethylad. This analog has an acyl group, a propionyl group at N1, and an ethyl group at N6. We see our molecular ion peak. We also see our peak at 27, 181, 72, and 57. We see a new peak at 235, and a new peak at 291. If you look closely at the peak, the fragment for 235, it looks very similar to the fragment we observed for 221, with the difference being instead of a methyl group on N6, we have an ethyl group. The fragment for 291 is related to the fragment 235 with an acyl propionyl substituent at N1. This concludes our section on fragmentation. I'll now turn it over to Danny, who will tell us what's new on the scene. So what's new? Uh, now that we've explored the fragmentation, let's look at our most recent example. In uh, September of 2022, Germany passed an amendment to the two, uh, 2016 New Psychoactive Substances Act prohibiting multiple NPS class substituents up to a mass of 500 AMU. This included the lyser gametes uh, covering the N18, N6, and N1 substitution sites. And almost as soon as this legislation passed, a new legal lyser gamete advertised as 1D LSD hit the market with vendors boasting that it didn't fall under this recent ban. The structure that the vendors were advertising um, was this isolated prodrug of LSD. Um, and there is a 1,1,2-trimethyl uh, cyclobutyl acyl substituent at the N1 position. Now, the legality of this structure is questionable at best, as the ring is four carbons and has three substituents, one, two, three. Um, however, it could be argued that the structure circumvents this cycloalkyl carbonyl um, legislation with a ring size of three to six because technically there are seven carbons on the substituent, but again, the ring size is four carbons. So either way, um, this is where understanding the synthesis becomes important. And we looked at that acyl substituent and we thought, what a nightmare. Um, the carboxylic acid starting material isn't commercially available and worse, it has a chiral center. So this is your chiral center. So now that would introduce a third chiral center to your lysergamid making multiple diastereomers um, if it was to be coupled together. So when we looked into it further, it takes nine steps to make this uh, starting carboxylic acid. And um, one of the things that clandestine labs tend to do is prefer cheap building blocks and this material would be expensive to manufacture. So we were skeptical that this was the structure that was actually being sold. Early on in 2023, Canada Border Services Agency approached us to see if we could supply a 1D LSD standard based on the structure that was advertised. Uh, since we were skeptical of the structure based on um, that acyl group, uh, we asked if we could see their data, and they graciously provided their EI mass spec data, which showed a mass of 434.18973. And they also had mass spec, mass spec fragmentation. And um, 
this mass of 434.18 is one methyl shy of this 447. So we thought about other easy access or easy compounds that are easy to access based on commercial starting materials. And we looked at this cyclohexanoyl group and considered that as a possibility because the mass was close, but the exact mass didn't match and the fragmentation was way off. And it would also fall under the C3 to C6 regulations. In 2023, the mystery was solved when Okada and Uino et al. published the identification of 1,000,2-carbonyl LSD from blotter paper falsely labeled as 1-LSD in the Journal of Forensic Toxicology. This was followed shortly by Tanaka and Kawamura et al. publishing a similar finding in drug testing analysis a few weeks later. Uh, the published EI mass spectrum had similar fragmentation to the CBSA sample and the correct exact mass. So we reached back out and suggested the thiophene structure that was um, then named 1TLSD for thiophene. Um, Camille, can you uh, walk us through the spectrum based on all of the fragmentation uh, rules and tips and tricks that you just taught us? Sure, Karen. Let us take a look at the spectrum of 1TLSD and see if we can identify any possible fragments. We see the molecular ion peak. We see the peak at 221 and 72 that we've seen from previous examples. We see new peaks at 111, where 111 now is the base peak, and this other new peak at 331. So what would these fragments look like? First, we have our molecular ion. Then we have a 221 peak, which is in alignment with what we have seen in our tips, that if we have a substituent, a methyl substituent at N6, we see this peak. We have our fragment for 72 from the diethylamine portion of our amide. And for our new signal at 111, our base peak, that corresponds to our thiophenyl acyl group. And for our peak observed at 3, 31, that is in agreement to our third uh, tip of interpretation, which states that if you have an acyl substituent, you will see an additional peak with the mass equal, with the mass of the peak observed equal, equaling 221 plus the mass of the acyl group minus 1. And in this case, we can see 331 is equal to 221 plus 111, which is our thiophenyl acyl group minus 1, which gives us 331. So the question now is, why is 111 our base peak? Due to other LSD analogs seen within the compilation of designer drug database, and based on what we have observed with fentanyl analogs, highly conjugated acyl group substituents such as toluyl and furanoyl tend to show the acylium ion as the base peak. This is because the acylium ion is stabilized through conjugation. If we go back and, and look at our spectrum for 1T LSD, and we look here at our thiophenyl uh, acyl substituent, we can see that it is very similar in structure to the furanoyl acyl substituent that we saw on the previous slide, and it is also highly conjugated. This would explain why we are observing the peak at 111 as the base peak. Let's talk about some analogs to be on the lookout for. There has been some chat on the web about this new analog, 1T Allad. This analog is similar in structure to Allad and 1T LSD. If we look at the structure, the top half here is the same as Allad with the acyl group from 1T LSD. Based on the structure, one would expect that the fragmentation of this new analog, 1T alad, will be a mix of the two. Based on what we know about the fragmentation of alad and 1T LSD, what fragments would we expect for the GCMS of 1T alad? We would expect 207, 181, and 247, all of which we have seen in the fragmentation for alad. We'd expect to see 111, possibly as a base peak, that this 111 we observed for 1TLSD, and 357, which would be just the isolated uh, fragment of 247. We can't say for sure that we will see all these peaks, but 
there are good possibilities. We won't know for sure until we get the data. We will go through a few exercises of possible quote-unquote unknowns, but before we do, here are some common ACL fragments and some common amino fragments. Please refer to the handout posted in the chat for this, along with the spectra for the exercises. Okay, so now we're going to perform exercise one. Uh, we'll give you two minutes to take a look over the spectra using your handouts. Uh, look at the summary of GCMS back fragmentation, your common acylium and ammonium fragments, and some of the examples, and see if you can't figure out uh, the structure. The timer will start now. We've got about one minute left. Thirty seconds. Okay, let's get to it. So observing the spectrum, we see our molecular ion peak. We also see the peak at 221, which is our second base peak. We see 207, we see 181, and 72. All of these peaks we are familiar with from our previous examples. We see a new peak at 263. And according to our third tip, <coughs> which states that another P could be observed if you have an acyl substituent and the relationship between 221 and that acyl substituent is that the mass of that peak is equal to 221 plus the mass of the acyl substituent minus 1. Now if we should designate the mass of the acyl substituent as x, and we plug that into our equation, we can figure out what the mass of the acyl group is. And according to our calculations, we got a mass of 43. And what do you see? We do have a peak at 43. And this peak corresponds to the acylium ion of the acetyl group. So based on that information, what, can, what conclusion can we draw about how the, or what the fragment, uh, um, for 263 looks like. We could see that, well, if we have the acetyl group, then the peak at 263 is simply the fragment for 221 plus the acetyl substituent. So based on all the pieces that we have here, we can conclude that a possible identity of, of our unknown could be ALD52. Now one could argue that well, in this case, we are designating the 72 as the diethyl substituent. What about MIPLA or LAMPA? Yes, that is a possibility. But we would need to have more analytical data 
and of course a standard to confirm these findings. That'll take us into exercise two and I'll give you another two minutes to take in all that information and see if we can't figure out what this LSD is. Timer is starting now. We get the one minute warning. Okay, let's look at the spectra and see what we're uh, working with here. Okay, so let's get to it. Again, we see our molecular ion peak. We see the peak at 221, which is our base peak. We see the peak at 207, 181, and 72. Now all these peaks, just like before, we have seen them in all our other examples that we have looked at. We also see a peak at 305. And uh, this again is in agreement with our third tip that states that if we have an acyl substituent, we would see another peak whose mass would be 221 plus the mass of the acyl substituent minus one. So if we were to use this relationship, just as we did in the previous exercise, and designate the, the mass of the acyl group as x, plug it into our equation, we would come to the conclusion that our mass, of, the mass of our acyl group is 85. And what do we see? A peak at 85. And this peak at 85 is uh, corresponding to our valeroil uh, acylium ion. So based on that, this piece of information, what would the fragment 305 look like? It would be 221 plus 85, the acyl group, to give us this fragment. Now that we have all the pieces, we can now come up with a structure. And our structure, possible identity of our unknown, is 1V LSD. Again, one could argue that, well, for the peak observed at 72, it could be a MEPLA, could be a LAMPA. Again, we would need other analytical methods and a standard to make this confirmation. There are a few new analogs that we've noticed on um, direct user sites. There's SBL and LSB, as well as this lysergic acid ethyl ester. These two compounds are esters, um, so they don't have the amide functionality that would allow for psychedelic effects, or as we learned in our pharmacology earlier, I would expect these to be masked precursors of lysergic acid, 
so they could be used in clandestine synthesis. And then as for this LSB, it's just LSD, but with the ethyl chain here moved onto this um, CH2 group, and then it forms a sec butyl uh, analog. Again, I don't know if that would be terribly active. It would probably have diminished activity, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it wouldn't be uh, marketable on direct user sites. So these are just a couple of things to keep an eye out for in your spectra. If you happen to encounter a spectra where you suspect a lysergamid, we have a wide variety of reference standards available with 1T LSD coming very soon. Keep an eye out on the website in the next handful of weeks. Um, it should be available very soon. If you don't find what you need, please do contact us at techserve at caymanchem.com. We'd be happy to assist. And with that, that concludes our workshop for today. I'd like to thank the conference organizers and workshop colleagues and the CFSRE MPS Discovery. Um, I'd like to extend a special thank you to Canada Border Services Agency for providing us their analytical data and allowing us to present that information today to you. I'd also like to thank Cayman Chemical Company and our Forensic Chemistry Division. We do work with a fantastic group of people who are always jumping in to assist, um, whether it comes down to synthesis, analysis, or even sales, and helping with the GC mass spec unknowns. Um, I'd also like to let you know that you can sign up to receive email notifications on new MPS standards and new tools. If you're looking for what's uh, coming out next, you can go to caymanchem.com uh, forward slash register. You can follow us on X, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Uh, if you do have a GC mass spec unknown, this QR code will take you to our GC mass spec drug identification tool. And if you have any questions um, or have any um, ID unknowns that you want to talk to us directly about, feel free to email Camille or I um, or TechServe at caymancom.com and we'd be happy to take any questions you have. And thank, thank you all for attending. attending.